Diddy late nights. Um, when anything can happen, I'm just vibing. So why? You gotta keep. You gotta keep the hair. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to wear this here in Toronto in the morning. Hey. One of the biggest suite in Toronto. Yeah. Before pause was invented. You know what I'm saying? Back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the over the Frosted Flakes. And we used to actually wrestle off of the... All for the Frosted Flakes. Nobody's going to acknowledge this for me. Puff just said we used to wrestle over the Frosted Flakes. And we're streaming live. That was stupid. One statement and leave us alone. I came here today just to tell the truth. So hopefully we can get down to the bottom of this. I'm 100% the, the charges against me are 100% false. And hopefully due, due to time, we'll start to see that. Thank you very much. What's up? You into the girl, okay? Listen, seven years ago, I'd have been like, yo, did you hire somebody to kill Pac? But no, you do it like a journalist. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we wouldn't even get into nonsense like that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's nonsense. Which we never believed, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Today, I want to talk about... Diddy, or P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, Puffy, Brother Love, whatever. He's had many names. There was recently a lawsuit that was filed by the singer Cassie, and she was his artist, signed to his label, but also his girlfriend for a long time. And the allegations in that lawsuit were insane. When Diddy settled with Cassie literally after one day, I basically fell down the rabbit hole. As a result of this lawsuit and settlement, people started bringing up things, really, really disturbing things about like sexual things that he does, violence, things he does with manipulation with artists and his label, deaths that they're trying to say allegedly, my theory, my conspiracy allegedly don't sue me. People are saying that there are certain deaths that have surrounded him that are suspicious. I want to do what I usually do on my channel. So I'm going to give you guys the facts. Okay, we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. I want to go through the timeline as things happened because when you do that, you see patterns and you see a really clear picture of how we got here. Diddy was born Sean John Combs. He was born in Harlem and he was raised in Mount Vernon in New York. So from the beginning, Diddy had uh, some tragedy in his life. His mom, she was a model, and his dad, he uh, was in the Air Force, but he also allegedly had connections to the drug trade. It is said that when Sean was two years old, he was in the car with his dad when his dad got shot, and he basically was there witnessing his dad getting shot, and his dad died. He was also in the Catholic Church. Like he was an altar boy as a kid and he was sort of raised with that. So Sean actually got the nickname Puff when he was a kid because when he was a kid he would get angry and he would quote huff and puff and so they started calling him Puff. So that's where it comes from from his childhood and then from there he played uh, sports in high school and then he got into Howard University where he was a business major. The thing is he wouldn't actually graduate from Howard University. He completed two years and then he dropped out. The reason why he dropped out is to become an intern at Uptown Records, which was owned by Andre Harrell. Andre Harrell died in 2020 and he died of natural causes. That is the official story. But even that death, there are theories that there is something suspicious about that, which we'll get to when we get to 2020 in the timeline. I just wanted to mention that so that you keep that in mind as I tell you what happened. So during this time when he dropped out and became an intern, he was known for throwing these crazy parties when he was in college. And they were like wild, like so many people would attend and he kind of got a reputation and was in sort of this like party scene. When he then became an intern at this record label, he also was kind of doing parties and promotion and things like that. 1990, Puff is an intern at Uptown Records, and in 1991, he has his first scandal, which involves death. At this time, he is a promoter for Uptown Records, and one of the artists that is signed by Uptown Records is Heavy D. 
Avi D is a rapper, and at this time, he was very popular. Avi D also died, and people are also talking about what was going on there and whether that's suspicious, but again, we'll get to that later. But Puff is now promoting this event. He rose through the ranks pretty quickly. It's a charity basketball game, and it's at a college in New York. The gym where the basketball game was being held only had a capacity for like 2,700-ish people, but it was oversold, and so 5,000 people were at, in attendance. So when they reached capacity, uh, the security closed the gym and would not let people in. So people that couldn't get in were pissed. What ended up happening is they basically like forced their way in, broke through the doors. There was like a stampede. 29 people were injured and nine people died. We were there at the doorway pulling people in, trying to get them. It was bananas. I, I, I pulled friends through the door. As you can imagine, this was a big deal at the time. And the mayor of New York, his administration, they published a report about what happened and they blamed what happened on Puffy, Puff, Sean John. They basically said that he hired people who were not qualified for the job. And if he had hired people that were qualified, this would not have happened, as well as the, the thing being oversold and over capacity. And so although he didn't face criminal charges for this, he was mentioned in that report and that ended up resulting in lawsuits from people whose family died in that stampede just like with Cassie and just like you're going to hear over and over and over again in this video, he settled with them when they sued him for this wrongful death. As I said, he rose through the ranks pretty quickly. He basically went from an intern to an executive in just a few years. Puff actually talks about how he rose through the ranks pretty quickly and he said, quote, I was like a wonder kid at Uptown. The first record I produced sold 2 million copies and I'd only produced it because the producer didn't show up. My talent is definitely a gift. I don't understand where it comes from. I don't play an instrument and I never went to school for music production, but I know exactly how a song should sound and how to give an artist direction. Some people have theories about that they're like, he's not necessarily a wonder kid and they criticize him. They're like, all he does is sample other people's music and he doesn't really have this talent, but they're claiming, okay, allegedly, and this is your opinion if, if you agree, but people say that he sort of did the casting couch thing. And this is gonna be a really common theme that you're gonna hear throughout this video is that there's sort of this, um, I don't know if I wanna use the word initiation, but like, in order to make it in this industry, you kind of have to do sexual things with the higher ups, okay? And they're saying, people, allegedly, that that's how he got his rise to fame. He performed certain acts and he got certain things in return. And that when he was in power, he expected the newcomers to do the same thing, sort of like this rite of passage. In 1993, he gets fired. Andre Harrell fires him. And this is why they say it happened. According to Puffy, this is why he got fired. Quote, I was very passionate and I didn't understand protocol or workplace politics. So I got fired because there can't be two kings in one castle. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful to Andre, but I was fighting so hard. He wanted to be more diplomatic and to make sure everybody felt involved. According to Andre Harrell, the reason why he fired Puffy is, quote, I fired Puff only to make him rich. I didn't want to sit there and be the one confining Puff because the corporation was telling me to do that. I'm not built that way. I told Puff he needs to go and create his own opportunity. You're red hot right now. I'm really letting you go so you can get rich. This ended up actually being one of the best things to happen to Puff career-wise because he ends up opening his own record label, but he does it with someone else. Who? Clive Davis. Okay. This is also where you have more rumors about the sort of casting couch thing. 
Clive Davis is this huge, huge music executive, and he was the founder of Arista Records, huge record label. Puff goes to Clive and basically tells him, like, I want to make hip hop mainstream and he wants to start a record label, but obviously he doesn't have the money to do that. So he's kind of looking to Clive Davis to fund this and Clive does. And it's like a joint venture between Arista Records and what is known as Bad Boy Entertainment. He also had Biggie with him, the rapper, right? So he's like, I have this artist, I wanna start my own label. And Clive Davis agrees, and that's how Bad Boy got started. Now, it's 1994, and this is when shit hits the fan. With regards to the murders that Diddy is allegedly, I said Diddy, I mean Puffy, whatever. I'm going to say all of the names all the time. It's hard. That's what she said. So it's 1994, and Biggie, the rapper, releases this album under the Bad Boy Records label, and it is a huge success. It's called Ready to Die. It's a classic nowadays. Also in 1994, two very bizarre and disturbing things happened. The first one is regarding Usher, the singer, and the second one is regarding Tupac, the rapper. So let's first talk about Usher, since we were talking about the whole casting couch thing. Usher at this time was like a preteen or teenager. I think he was like 13. He was a teenager. And he was just starting out in his career. And L.A. Reid, another music executive who has other allegations about him too, like it's crazy the amount of allegations of like weird sex type things. Anyway, he says, and this is all out in the open, he felt like Usher was too soft. He didn't have that sort of like edge, that street style thing. And they wanted to sort of give him an, an edgier image and sort of like rough him up, if you will. Uh, Puff already had that image. L.A. Reid says that he sent 13-year-old Usher to go live with Puffy, who was in his 20s and known for these crazy wild parties and stuff, and send him to, quote, Puffy's flavor camp. There was this interview with Howard, Howard, with Howard Stern, where Usher talks about like the wild parties. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you York over to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> to learn <laughs> some Flavor Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. Did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were thirteen. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. But I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. And then they ask him about, uh, would you send your kids there? And he's like, hell no. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to puffy camp? <laughs> hell know? no. And that's when I found this old video of Kevin Hart, Usher, and Puffy. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause, but like, that's how... I mean, Puffy is talking about waking up in bed with Usher when Usher was young and some sort of thing about cereal and frosted flakes. Back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the over the frosted flakes before pause was invented. You know what I'm saying? But it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the... All for the frosted flakes. He used to always get up early with me. <laughs> now he's one of the richest stars yo, in the world. And I'm yo, like, okay. nobody's going to acknowledge this for me. Puff just said we used to wrestle over the frosted flakes. And we're streaming live. That was stupid. A lot of people feel like this is very inappropriate. And that's when the, oh, the grooming thing comes into play, which is going to happen often that you'll hear, is that Diddy was you know gay and that he would groom these male artists that were young and up and coming and maybe allegedly allegedly take advantage of them allegedly when i was looking into this i also stumbled on justin bieber because justin bieber was kind of like mentored by usher and even uh puff puffy diddy and then i found this thing where ellie reed is talking about when usher introduced bieber to him and the way he did it was tom i have a gift for you I have a gift. I'm coming with a gift. And the gift is like a little young Bieber. 
people are like, what a gift? Like, it sounds weird, but it could just be like, Hey, this is an amazing artist. I have a gift for you. Like, this is great. Or also it could be like really, really gross. It depends on how you want to take it. So now let's talk about Tupac because also in 1994, Tupac gets shot. Not when he gets killed before that he got shot five times and he survived. And after he got out of the hospital, uh, he did an interview where he basically accused Puffy and Biggie of being behind his attempted murder. So at this time, Tupac and Biggie are friends. Tupac knows Puffy because that's, you know, uh, Biggie's producer, boss, whatever you want to call it. So they, they all know each other. They all get along. So Tupac is in New York and he goes to this recording studio to record the record. Um, he looks up as he's getting to the elevator to go up to the floor where they're at. And he notices a friend of Biggie's who calls out to him. He says, hi. And then all of a sudden, as he's waiting for the elevator, he says that these three guys, they come up to him and his friends and they pull out their guns and they basically try to rob them. They tell them, get on the ground and give us your stuff and whatever. But according to Tupac, he says that he felt like the robbery was a ruse, that they were more focused on him than anyone else, and that they shot him several times. And even the bullet that hit uh, one of his friends was actually one that went through him first. And then he talks about how he ends up getting in the elevator, going up, and that's where he sees Biggie and Puffy and Andre Harrell and that they were all acting really weird. And that's when he felt like they were behind it. And he talks about this in an interview with Vibe magazine. And I want to read you some quotes. So this is what Tupac says. He says, so we jumped in the elevator and went upstairs. I'm limping and everything, but I don't feel nothing. It's numb. When we get upstairs, I looked around and it scared the shit out of me. The interviewer says, why? He says, because Andre Harrell was there. Puffy was there. Biggie. There was about 40 N-words there. All of them had jewels on. More jewels than me. I saw Booker, and he had this look on his face like he was surprised to see me. Why? I had just beeped the buzzer and said I was coming upstairs. Nobody approached me. I noticed that nobody would look at me. Andre Harrell wouldn't look at me. I had been going to dinner with him the last few days. He had invited me to the set of New York Undercover, telling me he was going to get me a job. Puffy was standing back too. I knew Puffy. He knew how much stuff I had done for Biggie before he came out. Basically, what he's implying is that they were all surprised to see him because they thought he would be dead because they were behind the killing. He feels like it, they wanted to either take out the competition or something like that. When this interview comes out, it is sort of the beginning of this whole East Coast versus West Coast rap rivalry that went on for years. And you may or may not know is that Tupac and Biggie would end up dead. And even Puffy would be accused allegedly of being behind Biggie's death too. But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So in 1995, Puffy starts a youth organization, like a, almost like a charity thing for inner city youth. And it's called Daddy's House. Also in 1995, there is a famous moment that happens at the Source Awards. It's like a hip hop award show. And there is a person called Suge Knight. Okay, Suge Knight had a record label on the West Coast called Death Row Records, and Tupac was signed to Death Row. And then you've got the East Coast where Puffy has Bad Boy and Biggie is signed to Bad Boy. So they're rivals, okay? There is a moment when Suge Knight is on stage and he says something that was basically a dig at Puffy. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, and won't have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, coming to death row. Now, although he didn't name Puffy directly, everyone knew that he was talking about Puffy. Even Puffy said that he felt like it was about him because he said, quote, I couldn't believe what he said. I thought we was boys. That's what Puffy said. Now, the reason for this is because Puffy was known, even though he was like supposed to be behind the scenes and an executive and a producer, he was always in 
the music videos of his artists. This East Coast, West Coast thing escalates even more. And then you have a murder that happens a month after this award show, this moment, that people accuse Puffy of being responsible for. And that is, they're at this nightclub in Atlanta. So Suge Knight from Death Row Records and his entourage are at this club, and Puffy and his entourage are at this club as well. There seems to be some sort of scuffle, and one of the people in Puffy's entourage shoots and kills Suge Knight's friend. That very moment, Suge looks at Puffy and tells him that he believes that he is behind this. In that moment, he's like, you did this. Puffy was actually interviewed about this, and this is what he said. It says, at the mention of the incident, Puffy sucks his teeth in frustration. Here's what happened, he says. I went to Atlanta with my son. At that time, there wasn't really no drama. I didn't even have bodyguards. So bodyguards. So that's a lie that I did. I left the club and I'm waiting for my limo talking to girls. I don't see Suge go into the club. We don't make any contact or nothing like that. He gets into a beef in the club with some N-words. I knew the majority of the club, but I don't know who he got into the beef with, what it was over or nothing like that. All I heard is that he took beef at the bar. I see people coming out. I see a lot of people that I know. I see him and I see everybody yelling and screaming and shit. I get out the limo and I go to him like, what's up? You all right? I'm trying to see if I can help him. That's my motherfucking problem, Puffy says, pounding his fist into his palm in frustration. I'm always trying to see if I can help somebody. Anyways, I get out facing him and I'm like, what's going on? What's the problem? Then I hear shots ringing out and we turn around and someone standing right behind me, his man, God bless the dead, gets shot and he's on the floor. My back was turned. I could have got shot and he could have got shot. But right then he was like, I think you had something to do with this. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was standing right here with you. I really felt sorry for him. The sense that if he felt that way, he was showing me his insecurity. Then the interviewer asks Puffy, are you worried that he now thinks you killed his friend? Do you believe you're in danger? And Puffy says, I never knew of my life being in danger. He says calmly, I'm not saying that I'm ignorant to the rumors, but if you got a problem and somebody wants to get your ass, they don't talk about it. What it's been right now is a lot of movie making and a lot of entertainment drama. Bad boys move in silence. If somebody wants to get your ass, you're going to wake up in heaven. There ain't no record going to be made about it. It ain't going to be no interviews. It's going to be straight up. Oh shit, where am I? What are these wings on my back? Your name is Jesus Christ? When you're involved in some real shit, it's going to be some real shit. A year after this, it was some real shit because that's when Tupac was shot and killed. The person who recently got arrested, like a couple months ago, for this murder, who admitted to it, claims that Diddy is the one who paid him. Okay, so keep that in mind as I tell you what happens. Before Tupac was murdered, though, on June 30th, 1996, there was this incident that happened. Puffy was taken to a hospital in New York, and he was treated for a, quote, deep cut to his lower right arm, and the Daily News called it a slit wrist. And the implication was that he did it to himself, like to, to sort of like unalive himself, if you will. And so during this interview, um, he was asked about this. And this is what he said. Puffy calls the story nonsense. Quote, I was playing with my girl and I reached for a champagne glass and it broke on my bracelet, cutting my arm. The girl who he's talking about at this time is Kim Porter. Kim Porter died in 2018. This is one of the deaths that people are talking about now because it was ruled as a natural death, like she died of pneumonia. And people from back then, even including one of her exes, said that this wasn't a natural death. Someone was out to get her. And people were saying that like, Diddy was behind Kim Porter's death. Here in 1996, 
there's a story coming out that he has this slit in his wrist and he had to get hospitalized for it. And he is saying that he was, quote, playing with his girl, who was Kim Porter at the time, his ex bodyguard, his name is Gene Deal. He talks about an incident that to me is exactly like what this is talking about. And I believe that they're the same incident. Allegedly, this is my theory, okay? One night uh, when they were at, at home at Kim's house on 110th Street, he wanted to, you know, put his hands on her in the wrong way. And Kim took one of those court screws and ripped his wrist up he, and hit an artery. And when she did that, he had to rush over to St. Luke's Hospital. This incident happened just a few months before Tupac was killed. There's a guy, his name is Dwayne Keith Davis, uh, but he goes by Keefe D, and he is a gang member. He's a member of uh, the South Side Crips in LA. And he has ties, though, to Puffy and that entourage. Now, this is the guy who got arrested for Tupac's murder. He wrote a book talking about it. He did interviews talking about it. And then that's how he got on police radar. And when police looked into it, they said that they could corroborate his story. He knew things that nobody would know unless they were there and involved. And so when he is saying that he did it and he is saying that Diddy ordered him to do it, it makes people think, hmm, hmm, hmm. Did he do it? Did he? Did he do it? So according to Keefe D., the hit that was ordered originally was on Suge Knight because Tupac and Suge Knight were in the car together when Tupac was shot and killed. According to Keefe D, first it was about killing Suge. Why? Because Suge, remember, felt like Puffy killed his friend, right? And so there was this incident that happened where gang members that were affiliated with Suge Knight went to someone who was affiliated with Puffy and asked him to give them Puffy's mom's address. This person refused to give them Puffy's mom's address and so they beat him nearly to death. According to Keefe D, when Puffy found out that Suge was sending people to figure out where his mom lived and was beating them and all this stuff, he felt like he was in danger. He was really about to get killed or his mom would get hurt or something like that. According to Keefe D, he wanted to take Suge out first. All right. Also, according to Keefe D, is that around this time, right, remember, Tupac is out here saying that Puffy and Biggie tried to kill him. And there's this whole beef going on and they're making diss tracks. And one of the diss tracks that comes out is called Hit Em Up. It's a song by Tupac, very disrespectful to Biggie and Puffy and all that. So according to Keefe D, when that song came out, it pissed Puffy off. And so he said, you know what? Kill both of them. I will give you a million dollars to kill Suge Knight and Tupac. Now, according to Keefe D, there were two people involved as well as him in this murder, Tupac's murder. One is his nephew, Orlando Anderson, who's known as Baby Lane. And the other guy is Earl Martin, who goes by Eric Von Zip or Zip for short. I'm going to refer to him as Zip. Now, Zip has strong ties with Diddy. Like, there's pictures of them together. Um, he's also a gang member providing, quote-unquote, security for these uh, rappers and stuff like that. Zip was very connected to Puff Daddy and even... Biggie, the rapper, all of them. They were all connected because it says here that he was the godfather of Biggie's kid. Zip is the person who introduced uh, the singer Faith Evans to Puffy. And Zip was allegedly present at both Tupac and Biggie's murders. So this is a quote from a recording where Keefe D is talking to police. So it's Terrell, you, Puffy, Zip, and a bunch of Southsiders. They didn't really have an exact date and time set. According to Keefe D, they happened to go to Las Vegas. There was a fight 
Mike Tyson was fighting someone. Tupac was also there for the fight. Now, during this Vegas trip, before Tupac got killed, he got into this big brawl and it's captured on security footage. What happened was that Diddy allegedly was so mad at Tupac and Chug that he had offered $10,000 if someone could steal a death row chain and bring him a death row chain. And this is like a thing in the rap world where like if you have a beef with someone or another group that you steal their chain and then you like publicly show that you have the chain of the person you're fighting with, like kind of like a trophy, like I stole their chain, like they're bitches or whatever. Orlando Anderson, Keefe D's nephew, was involved in stealing a death row chain prior to them going to Las Vegas. Tupac, with his group, noticed him in the uh, MGM hotel lobby, recognized him as someone involved with stealing the chain, and that's how they got into this brawl. So they are basically hitting him for stealing the chain. But what Tupac didn't know was that this hit was out on him, that the person he beat up was the nephew of the guy who was going to kill him, and that Zip and Keefe D were in Vegas at that time. Now, according to Keefe D, he said, I wasn't planning on doing it in Vegas. I didn't even have a pistol with me. But Zip had guns with him. And so when they found out that Tupac and his crew jumped Keefe D's nephew, they said, you know what? Let's do it now. Perfect opportunity, baby. That was zip talking? Yeah. Because of what happened with yeah. Yeah. And that's when you have the infamous incident, right? There's even a photograph of Tupac and Suge right before they get shot in the car that they would get shot in, the black BMW. The car that did this drive-by shooting that killed Tupac was a white Cadillac. And in that white Cadillac, was Orlando Anderson, the nephew who got jumped, Keefe D, the guy who recently got arrested, and Zip. And so they end up pulling up next to that car. They're trying to kill both Suge and Tupac, according to Keefe D, but Suge only got a graze. It hit his head, but the bullet grazed Suge. Suge didn't die. Suge is still alive. He's in prison right now, but he's alive. Tupac died. Now, According to Keefe D, because Suge was alive and Tupac was dead, they only got $500,000. According to Keefe D, a few days after the murder, he's hanging out with Zip in Las Vegas when they get a call from Puffy. And Puffy says, was that you? Like, are you guys responsible for this? And they say yes. And according to Keefe D, Puffy was, quote, happy as hell. So now that they've done that, they're expecting to get paid. According to Keefe D, he never heard from them ever again. And then Keefe D ends up getting caught up in something else and getting arrested and going to federal prison. And what ends up happening is shortly after Tupac's killing, Orlando Anderson gets killed in retaliation by LA gang members because of, there was this footage of the fight before and people were saying he was involved. So the whole street justice thing happened. What is Zip doing? Well, Zip took all the 500K, allegedly, kept it for himself, didn't share it with anyone, and actually ended up opening a nightclub with that money called Zip Code. However, Zip would end up getting shot by a gang member and he ends up dying at some point. According to Keefe D, this is why he ends up snitching. The detective says, since you've been out of prison, have you talked to Zip? Keefe says, not one time. The detective says, what about Puffy? Keefe says, not one time. I tried to call them several times, though. If he would have just given us half the money, I would have say, stayed strong. Keep in mind, in the court of public opinion at this time, in the 90s, people already were saying that Puffy was somehow involved because you had that incident in 1994 where Tupac got shot and he survived and he told everyone that Biggie and Puffy were behind it. And then now he actually gets killed and people are like, they finally did what they wanted to do. According to an ex-LAPD officer, 
they actually interviewed Puffy to see if he was behind it because when they were doing their investigation, like that came up several times. And this LAPD officer said, quote, it was under very controlled circumstances. Puffy is insulated by his lawyers who are going to protect him at all costs. We can all agree that justice ought to be blind and not be influenced by money, but the reality is that it is. The detective also says that he believes that uh, Puffy did have motive for this, saying, quote, he was in a precarious situation where Suge Knight was actively hunting him down. Suge held him responsible for the 1995 death of a friend in Atlanta, so there was this sense of desperation that Combs was working from. Six months after Tupac's murder, the rapper Biggie gets murdered. It's March 9th, 1997 in LA. Remember Gene Deal? I told you about Puffy's ex bodyguard who told the story about Kim Porter. Well, he talks about Biggie's murder because he was there and Puffy was there too. And this is how he says it went down. So this was after an award show, they were leaving and they were in separate cars. So Biggie and his security were in a vehicle and Puffy and his security, which is Gene Deal, were in a separate vehicle. Now, according to Gene, he knew because he had heard rumors that something was going to happen that night, that there was a, a retaliatory attack that was planned that was going to target both Puffy and Biggie because people thought they were responsible for Tupac's murder. He says he told Puffy about this, and he sort of implies that this information was not relayed to Biggie or his security. It's like blowing through red lights because he didn't want to be a sitting duck and that that wasn't the case with Biggie and his security and that he was the one who pulled Biggie out of the car when Biggie got shot and how horrible and awful it was. And so a lot of people feel like either Puff knew this retaliation was happening and didn't warn Biggie about it or he was behind it. So the first thing I thought of when I heard this is why. It didn't seem like it would be in Puffy's interest to kill Biggie because from the way I looked at it and what I knew at the time, because to me it seemed like this is your artist who's very successful. You're making a lot of money from him. And it's like, why would you kill your artist? But then when I read a certain thing and I saw what happened afterwards, it wasn't the most far-fetched thing. Now, hear me out. Okay, hear me out. Allegedly. Another thing about Puffy is that he's known for being really exploitative and shitty and predatory when it comes to the artist that he signs to his record label. He gives him really shitty deals. It's been mentioned over and over again, and Biggie was just one of those shitty deals. Furthermore, it is alleged that Biggie was actually planning on leaving Bad Boy Records and starting his own record label. So although he was making puffy money at the time, that wasn't going to last. Once he fulfilled his contract, he was going to become competition to Puffy, not something that he's benefiting from. And according to people, this enraged Puffy. When you look at Puffy's success after Biggie died, you could definitely say that he benefited the most from Biggie's death. And I'll tell you why. Just a few months after Biggie was killed is when Puffy released a song that would change his career. And that was the I'll Be Missing You song. Do you remember that? It was huge at the time with Faith Evans, who was Biggie's girlfriend. And it was a tribute to Biggie. It broke records and it catapulted Puffy to a level of fame that he had not seen before. So that song was the first rap song to debut at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. And it stayed at number one for 11 weeks. Okay. Then in 1998, Puff Daddy was nominated for five Grammys for that album, and he ended up winning Best Rap Album. So you could definitely say that he benefited from Biggie's death. Remember at the Source Awards when Suge Knight was like, if you don't want the producer to be like all in the videos, you know, come to death row. That was something that everyone talked about, Puffy, that he wanted to be the star. He wanted to be 
at the forefront. It's just that he couldn't rap and he wasn't good at writing songs or anything. Even one of his lyrics I remember is like, don't worry if I write raps, I write checks or something. So he, he didn't have the talent to be a rapper, but he wanted the glory and the stardom of that. But anyway, let's move on because something else also happened in 1998. Right when he is like becoming this huge star is when the gay rumors start. Oh, I was like, this ain't no goddamn way. This motherfucking natural. This motherfucking natural. And it is started by none other than Wendy Williams. Okay, how you doing? Now, Wendy Williams at this time was a radio talk show host. And she got this information sent to her, proof something of Diddy being gay. At the time, Puff Daddy, whatever, Puffy. And so she talks about it on her radio show. Apparently, this upset Puff daddy so much that he pulled strings behind the scenes to get her fired. Now it's a year after he wins the Grammy and all that, and he ends up attacking a music executive. His name is Steve Stout. There was another rapper, Nas, and this was his song. And there was a scene where Puff Daddy was depicted as Jesus being crucified. This was actually his idea. Not only did Diddy, Puffy, whatever, ask for the scene and have them spend so much extra money for the scene, but he watched the final cut and approved it. And they were going to have this disclaimer about like, this doesn't mean that he sees himself as Jesus or whatever. Like they were going to put a disclaimer, but he approved it. What ended up happening though, is that he went and spoke to his mom and his pastor or something like that. And they sort of told him that that wasn't a good idea that it was blasphemous. And so he ends up at the 11th hour, right before they're about to send this video to MTV, he calls Steve Stout and he tells him, I don't want this scene in the video anymore. I need you to cut it out. I don't think it's a good look. And Steve tells him like, listen, I'm going to try, but he claims, according to Steve, that he didn't really have the authority to make that decision, but that he would relay the message to the higher up executives that are going to be the ones who approve that and see what he can do. Well, turns out these higher ups at Sony were not going to cut it. They spent all this money on this scene and they wanted to keep it as it was. So they said, okay, we're good to go. And they send it to MTV. MTV airs the music video. According to Steve Stout, as the music video is airing, he gets a phone call from Diddy, who is pissed, enraged. And this is what he said, Steve, quote, he just screamed into the phone and hung up. Then he says he gets another call from someone at Bad Boy who tells him, Puffy is on his way to you right now and he is very angry. And then Steve says he was in the middle of a meeting when all of a sudden, Puffy walks in with his associates, entourage, goons, whatever you want to call it, and they go crazy. Quote, he punched me in the face and then he grabbed the phone and bashed me in the head with it. One minute I'm in the middle of a meeting and the next minute I'm down on the floor and Puffy and his guys are kicking and pounding me. One of them picks up a chair and throws it at me. Then Puffy throws my desk over and they just walk out of the, and they just walk out. Then Puffy... Th Oh my God, I'm like, I almost choked on my spit. Then Puffy throws my desk over and they just walk out like nothing happened. I was laying there on the floor bleeding. My jaw and my head were all swollen. I couldn't move my arm. It was a traumatic experience. And in the middle of it, I didn't know exactly how to feel. I was upset, embarrassed, scared, angry. As far as I'm concerned, this was an attempt on my life. The only reason I'm not dead is because they missed. And so he says after they left, he went to the hospital and he pressed charges. Puffy was arrested and he was charged with second degree assault and criminal mischief. He ends up pleading guilty to a lesser charge and he only got one day of anger management. Then he has this statement that he gives to MTV about what happened. And he says, this is what Puffy says happened. He goes, I basically went to his office and what happened in his office, I really can't speak about, but I can say this, the way I handled myself in his office was completely wrong. And I've since apologized to Steve about that. And I felt like, you know, I just disappointed myself. I don't know how disappointed he really was because that same year, August, 1999, 
Puffy goes to do this interview with a guy, a TV host. His name is Roger Leo. He's also known as Roger Mills. And during this interview, he asks Puffy about the allegations that Puffy had something to do with Biggie's death. This enraged Puffy. He got so upset, he ended the interview and he stormed off. Then, according to Roger, someone who works for Diddy came up to him right after and asked him to buy the footage of that incident that just happened. And Roger refused. He said, no, I'm not going to sell you the footage. He had it in a tape in a camera. So he says after that, he took the camera, he's holding it, and he starts leaving to get in his car and go. He says that as he's going towards his car, he gets approached by people who are associated with Diddy. And they basically tell him, give us the tape. Again, he says, no, I'm not going to give you the tape. That's when he says they basically uh, twisted his neck, injured his shoulder, roughed him up, grabbed the camera, destroyed the camera and the tape right then and there, and that he was afraid and he like gets in the car and leaves. Later on, he sues for this incident. And in that lawsuit, he says what I just told you. Before this lawsuit happened, though, there was a criminal investigation. This happened in Detroit, by the way. And the Detroit police, they said that they can verify that the incident did actually happen, but that they weren't able to identify who roughed him up and that that's why they weren't able to bring charges. But they said that this definitely happened. So now this guy, Roger, he is trying to resolve it directly with Diddy or Puffy at the time and he's saying that he just wanted like an apology for it because the tape is destroyed but he's like upset no criminal charges he wants an apology they won't do that and that's why he ends up filing the lawsuit can you guess what happened with the lawsuit can you guess did you guess that Puff Daddy settled it and paid this guy money because that's what happened we don't know how much but he paid him money Interesting. Why did he get so upset about the question and why did he not want anyone to see him get upset about the question? Did he do it? Is that why? Did he? Did he do it? Two months after this incident with Roger and the tape, Diddy gets in trouble again. It's December 27, 1999. This is when he was with uh, Jennifer Lopez, J-Lo. At this time, she was Jenny from the block. And his quote-unquote protege, a rapper that was up and coming, that was signed to his label, his name is Shine. All three of them were together at a nightclub. And this is when shots are fired, literally. So according to witnesses, this is what happened. Puff was leaving the club with Shine and J-Lo when he bumped into someone and him bumping into this person caused their drink to fall out of their hand. The person who he bumped into was this guy called Scar. That was his nickname. When Puff knocks the drink out of his hand, he gets upset and he ends up shoving him. They're yelling at each other and then their friends get involved. So Scar's friends sort of come and start talking shit and Shine comes near Puff and is talking shit and then according to witnesses someone from Scar's group throws a stack of money in Puff Daddy's face which made him very angry. Witnesses say that that's when Puff and Shine both drew their guns and then Scar drew his gun and that's when shots were fired. As a result of this three people in the nightclub were shot. Puff and J-Lo, they get in a vehicle together with Puff's driver, who's driving, and they flee the scene. Shine also flees the scene, and the police end up pulling J-Lo and Puff over as they're fleeing, and that's when they find guns in the trunk of the car, and they arrest J-Lo, they arrest Diddy, they arrest Shine, the driver got arrested too. I 
One statement and leave us alone. I came here today just to tell the truth. So hopefully we can get down to the bottom of this. I'm 100%, the, the charges against me are 100% false. And hopefully due, due to time, we'll start to see that. Thank you very much. What's up with you your relationship okay? with Jennifer? Although J-Lo got arrested, they end up releasing her and they don't really charge her with anything. And then the driver, he tells police that Puff tried to bribe him to tell him to tell police that the gun was his and that the gun wasn't his. He had nothing to do with anything. And so they end up charging Puff, not just with the crime of the shooting, but also trying to bribe the driver. And I just want to make you feel like comfortable, you know what I'm saying? Make your family feel comfortable. What exactly Combs meant by that is in dispute. They also charge Shine with the same thing. They charge Diddy minus the bribing thing. And they both plead not guilty and they go to trial. At the time, this was like a huge deal. Puff had really good lawyers, including Johnny Cochran. Shine didn't get those good lawyers. In the end, despite witnesses coming out and saying that they saw Puffy shooting and that he had the gun and everything like that, Puffy is found not guilty, acquitted of all charges, and Shine he is found guilty of most of the charges against him, and he gets like 10 years. He ends up serving nine years. And I remember at this time, there was a song that Shine did about not snitching. Like I remember hearing the song and people talking about this. And he says something like, uh, what you gonna do when shit hit the fan? Take it like a man or snitch like a bitch. I remember that. For the first time ever, the imprisoned rapper speaks on camera about his co-defendant. Like, how do you call a witness to testify against your comrade? I'm facing 25 years, and you looking at probation. Yeah. You don't have to hold my hand. You don't have to do nothing, but don't, don't try to hurt me. This is when J-Lo and Diddy, then they broke up. Guess what happens after this? We get our first name change, okay? After this trial that was sensationalized and now he is found not guilty, he changed his name from Puff Daddy to P. Diddy. So now we're in the 2000s. And during the early 2000s, uh, P. Diddy was on this show. He produced the show and he starred in it called Making the Band. And this was a crazy show because it showed you sort of how he was, how he was so demanding and outrageous. Puffy just told us to go to the store in Brooklyn and bring him back a cheesecake and walk. Let's go, no. making the bitch, not I'm making not the bad. Slave labor right here, man. And this was on camera. Imagine what he did behind the scenes. Remember Kimberly Porter, his on and off again ex-girlfriend, the one who died in 2018. Now there's another incident that happens that we know of allegedly, allegedly, which was in 2005. This is when people say he broke her nose. Allegedly, they say that they were in Saint-Tropez in France on a yacht and there was a party. And then at 2 a.m., people could hear Diddy and Kim fighting for hours. And then at 7 a.m., they say they heard a scream. And that is when allegedly he hit her and broke her nose and it was so bad that she needed to have plastic surgery and so he paid to have a plastic surgeon flown in to Saint-Tropez from Geneva to secretly fix her nose where then she was in hiding to heal and then later on when she was asked about that she said that she fell and hit her nose on a table and that's what happened. The same month of this nose incident is when P. Diddy changes his name again and becomes just Diddy. In 2007, Diddy gets sued again for hitting someone again. And he's going to settle with them again. This time it's this uh, professional poker player named Gerard Rex, Rechnitzer, Rech, Gerard, okay? He says, Gerard, that they were outside of a nightclub in LA and Diddy starts talking to this guy, Gerard's girlfriend. And Gerard wasn't around at the time. And so he says that he walked towards them, like as he approached Diddy talking to his girlfriend, out of nowhere, Diddy punches him. Then he says, Diddy shoves his girlfriend 
and tries to spit on another woman there. And so they're like freaking out and they're trying to leave. And then some people grab Diddy to get Diddy to leave. They put him in a car. And then he said, as they're leaving, Diddy is hanging out halfway from the window of the passenger side in the car and he's staring them down. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. Something else happened in 2007 too. That's when Diddy and Cassie begin their relationship, which I don't know if you can even call it that, but that's when she is signed to his label and is his artist. And according to her lawsuit, she gets groomed into being his damn near sex slave. So keep in mind that at this time, Cassie is 19 and Diddy is in his late thirties. So he's almost twice her age. The next year in 2008, someone dies. This person is an executive at Def Jam and his name is Shakir Stewart and he dies of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. People are talking about how he was being blackmailed with gay Im video of or images of him performing a sex act and that he was being blackmailed by Diddy with this, allegedly they say that Kim Porter, his ex, was in a relationship with him at one point and that he was mad about that. You'll see when we talk about Cassie's lawsuit, okay? A couple years from now is when she claims that he blew up the rapper Kid Cudi's car because they had something going on. And then Kid Cudi confirmed this through a representative to the New York Times that Diddy had his car blown up. So he's not opposed allegedly to killing a man that he perceives is doing something with a woman that he feels like he owns. So is that motive? Is that why he blackmailed him? Did he do that to him? Did he? Did he do it? Can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> if you know, you know. So I'll tell you like what I found, but keep in mind that this is not a fact. It's a rumor. But... What I read was, remember L.A. Reid, the executive I told you, who sent Usher to Puffy to do the Flava Camp thingy? And he also has an accusation that he was being inappropriate with an employee. Well, from what I read, allegedly, not true, just gossip, that this act, this sex act, was Shakir Stewart performing fellatio on L.A. Reid. And that this is, was part of the sort of like initiation thing, the casting couch thing that I told you, where in order to make it, you have to like, basically they say S some D to make it in the industry. This information, mind you, comes from uh, a book by someone who was signed to Diddy. And this person is called Mark Curry. And he wrote a book called Dancing with the Devil, How Puff Burned the Bad Boys of Hip Hop. Now keep in mind the tell-all book thing is going to become a huge part of the theories of why certain people get killed because there were rumors that they were going to write a book because when this guy wrote a tell-all book, oh my God, he said crazy shit. He talks about how he witnessed an incident where Diddy found out that his ex-girlfriend at the time, Kim Porter, was seeing Shakir Stewart and that he flew into a rage and went with his quote goons and attacked Shakir with a chair. And he talks about Biggie. He said, after Biggie signed the contracts that Puff forced on him, for example, he walked away with only $25,000. To avoid people finding out just how broke Biggie was when he was killed, Puff announced that he was giving the Fallen Stars family several million dollars. What I always called him was the master of evasion. That Puff is very keen, very smart when it comes to avoiding the question and sending you off with what you thought was an answer. It's like you can go into his office, talk about a million dollar deal that you deserve. And when you leave the office, you leave thinking all you need to do is sell one more cheesecake to make it happen. And then Curry says, if in the event anything happens to me, blame him. Now it is 2011 and that's when Heavy D dies. Okay. Heavy D, if you'll remember, was the rapper that was signed to Uptown and he was the one performing at that charity baseball basketball sorry game where Puffy was working and had his first scandal in 1991 with the stampede when people died. Okay, that's how far back Puffy and Heavy D go. 
Evie D dies in 2011, apparently of uh, cardiac arrest. And this is when I want to talk about someone known as Jaguar Wright. Okay. She is an R&B singer. She was affiliated with like the Roots and other people. Like she's got a lot of connections in the industry and she has been for years saying all these things about Diddy and was discredited and made to sound crazy. Um, and then now that all these things have come out about Diddy, her interviews and stuff are going viral again. And everyone's like, she tried to tell us, she tried to tell us. So these are her, you know, allegations. A lot of the things she said, I tried to f find like actual evidence and it's hard to find. Um, if I do find something, they're using her as a reference. So she technically, you could say, has insider knowledge, but as for like concrete physical evidence, it's more just what she's saying, okay? I want to read you a quote from Jaguar. She says, Uptown Records started with five people, Andre Harrell, Al B. Sure, Heavy D, and Puffy. And Kim Porter was the longest working employee. She was there from the very beginning. She was Andre's personal assistant. Kim is dead. Heavy D is dead. Andre Harrell is dead. The only two left are Puffy and Al, and Al almost died. Isn't that interesting? She says, you want to know what they all had in common, though? The survivors and the late of Uptown Records, they were all writing tell-all books. According to her, Heavy D is now going to write a tell-all book. Is there something bad that he may say about Diddy? Is that something that Diddy wanted to silence quiet? Did he do something to Heavy D? I don't know. Heavy D was heavy. He had a heart problem. He died. It's not the farthest thing to believe that he may have died of natural causes, but that is what the speculation is. 2011, Heavy D dies. Now it's 2012. This is when Kid Cudi's car is blown up by Diddy, allegedly. Remember, these accusations were made in a lawsuit by Cassie, which was settled by Diddy one day after. Why would you settle a lawsuit with these kind of accusations if you didn't do it and you definitely have the money to fight it unless you knew that fighting it would create bigger problems for you because now they would try to get, what, what do they call that, um, uh, discovery and all that stuff and she would release all the evidence that she has. It was better for him for whatever reason to settle it than to fight it when he can afford to fight it. Adding to that is the fact that after this lawsuit came out, Kid Cudi was asked, did this happen? And his representative told the New York Times, this is all true, that he blew up his car. In 2013, he has a quote scuffle with rapper J. Cole at a VMA after party. And the witnesses of that, they say that what happened was that Diddy was very intoxicated and he went to Kendrick Lamar, another young rapper. And at this time, Kendrick had released this song um, it was a verse on someone else's song uh, called Control, where he was calling out a lot of rappers in the industry and saying he was the king of New York. And so according to witnesses, Diddy goes up to him and like confronts him about it. Like, oh, you're the king of New York. Like, I'm the king of New York. And he tries to pour a drink on Kendrick Lamar. J. Cole tries to intervene. And that's when they get into the scuffle. A year later in 2014, it's alleged that Diddy punched the rapper Drake. And this happened in Miami, they're saying. And the reason why he punched Drake is because they fought over who had the rights to the beat uh, for the song Zero to 100. And witnesses say they were like arguing. And then all of a sudden, Diddy is heard saying, you will not disrespect me. And then he punched Drake. And so word of that spread. And then Diddy was on this radio show called The Breakfast Club. And he was asked, did you punch Drake like everyone is saying? And he says, I didn't do nothing to Drake. Drake is my friend. So I don't know. So a year after Diddy allegedly punches Drake, he gets into another physical altercation. And this time it is with a UCLA football coach. Diddy's son played football for UCLA. And Diddy was there one time when he overheard the coach tell his son, quote, I don't care if your dad's here, this is UCLA. I'm going to treat you just like I treat everyone else. Apparently, this upset Diddy so much that he ends up going into 
this coach's office with his son where he gets into an argument with him, rushes over, starts grabbing him, and the employees there have to, quote, forcibly remove him from the office. And during that, he's so upset, he grabs a kettleball and throws it at an intern. Diddy denied the claims and through a representative, they were like, if he did do anything, it was in self-defense. The DA in LA um, decided, that rhymed, <laughs> decided not to press charges. I don't know why I went from like joke to serious, like in two seconds. Two years later in 2017, Diddy's private chef, she sues him. And she says that he sexually harassed her uh, would do things in retaliation if she had a problem and would not pay her overtime. And she says that he would, quote, regularly ask her to serve food to him and his friends immediately following sexual activity where they were totally naked. And that um, one time during these things where she has to serve them naked, he would ask her if she liked his body. 2017, he sued for this and he ends up settling with her too. Shocking. And he also changes his name again. This is when he creates the brother love name. So his legal name is Sean John Combs. Um, right now, as it stands, it's actually Sean Love Combs. And in 2017, he came out and he was like, I'm changing my name to love, brother love, 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 love. Yeah, okay. So that's 2017. Now it's 2018. This is when Kim Porter dies. Someone calls 911 and they say that they thought she was sleeping, but she's not breathing. The death certificate, it said that the cause of death was deferred and people were speculating as she was young. She was in her forties. I think she was 47 at the time. She was known for being very healthy. After this delay and them deferring it, uh, the coroner came out and said that the cause of death was pneumonia. I think it's a low bar pneumonia. I don't know if I'm saying the low bar part correctly. And that her manner of death was natural. After Kim died, Diddy spoke out and said that her last words to him were to take care of her kids. He said, quote, three days before she passed, she wasn't feeling well. She had the flu and she sent the kids over to my house so they wouldn't get sick. One night I was checking on her and she was like, Puffy, take care of my babies. She actually said that to me before she died. So according to the coroner, they say that a week before her death, Kim complained of a sore throat and had developed a fever of 102 degrees. She tested negative for influenza, A and B, and strep, uh, but she was being treated with antibiotics, vitamins, and a painkiller in the week leading up to her death. And then uh, the day before she died, her fever was down to a normal 96 degrees, and she watched movies with her family and seemed fine. The coroner added it was later determined that she died from low bar pneumonia and low bar pneumonia is described as an infection of the lung caused by bacteria, immune cells, sends? immune cells invade the airspace where oxygen is taken in. And this is accompanied with necrosis, which is the death of cells. Pneumonia decreases the lungs ability to take in oxygen and over time it can cause sudden death. And um, she was given a medication, it's an anti-inflammatory called Toradol by her doctor, and it's usually given for pain. And then they also gave her saline fluids and vitamins. And the day before her, dead, she re her death, she reported a streak of blood in her phlegm. So they said she didn't have alcohol, drugs, barbiturates, cocaine, opioids, all of that was negative. And she didn't have viruses like adenovirus, influenza A and B. So based on that and what I just told you, that's how they came up with the pneumonia thing. Al B. Schur is the father of Kim Porter's eldest son. And he made a tweet. And this is what he said. The morning of the Soul Train Awards, BET pre-production, Al B's around. I just found this footage from the morning I learned of Kim Porter's murder and how it ripped the soul from my physical body. I was on the way to film the pre-show packages for the BET Awards with um, 
Tisha Campbell Martin and Tashina Arnold when I receive a call from PR icon Queenie Donaldson asking me if I was okay and did I hear the news? I had no clue. I do know very clearly that Kimberly didn't just check out all of a sudden over pneumonia. That's some bullshit. Really? This is where I get in trouble. We just celebrated our son Quincy's New Deal and Christmas special with Netflix and she was in fantastic health as well laughing seeing me and Diddy's mutual exchange at the theater. I'm going to leave it here. Don't let the love songs fool you. Stole my father's ring. Top row of my sneakers. Shut up and dribble question mark. These are all hashtags by the way. Hashtag Ivy and um hashtag love and something radio show and I'm in at I'm a new Jack sexy he would end up deleting this post by the by and then he also did another post that he also ended up deleting it's a picture of him with Kimberly and he says she sent me this saying life imitating art art imitates life now it all makes sense hashtag star hashtag at Fox at the time their son was on this show star on Fox. She told me other stuff too. She was running. I said, call the FBI. You, and then he comments on his own post saying, you would never believe what she went through. This started the speculation that he felt like it was homicide, not natural causes. And this is also when people started saying that she was going to write a tell-all book and that that was the incentive for allegedly her death if it was a homicide and that who would be responsible for that allegedly people are saying that allegedly it could be Diddy and then this post started circulating and I can't verify this post at all I found this on a TikTok that is it I, I don't know if this is completely fake or what but that's my disclaimer I'm just going to read it to you it's an email that was sent and it's redacted but the subject matter is Kim Porter's book still in the works, my love, exclamation point. And this is what it says. It says, good morning. I tried calling you back last night, but figured you were knocked out by the time I tried to contact you. But I wanted to let you know that Kim Porter's book is finally in progress and will be released. And that is Redacted. I met with Redacted this past Sunday evening and she showed me the rough draft that Kim sent her. When I looked over details of Kim and Diddy's relationship that will be exposed in the book, it will absolutely blow your mind. I was devastated to read the things that Kim put up and witnessed during her relationship with Diddy. Also, some of the things in her book cover Diddy's, and then it sort of cuts off, and then it says breaking his... Uh, and then it says breaking his foot and how she used a strap on to please Diddy and how she would hysterically cry alone after doing so. How she protected Al B. Sure from running into Diddy and would call him to warn him not to show up to certain places to avoid trouble and how tried to put an end to Diddy by using a screw. How the East Coast, West Coast faked having beef to eliminate Biggie and Pac to obtain their masters and full on catalog because both Pac and Big were planning to come together and challenge Bad Boy and Death Row to own the rights to their music. It's just a lot. It's a lot of things that I promise not to mention, but this book will be earth shattering once it hit the shelves. Anyways, don't forget to let me know the dates you are planning to fly out here to LA so we can accommodate your stay. And with all the threats you have been receiving, we must provide you security. I'm off to blank for the holidays, but I will call you when we get settled, probably around 10 p.m. your time. And then there's an emoji heart and prayer hands. A lot of people are also talking about this image of Kim wearing a t-shirt with Tupac on it before she died, like not too long before she died at an event with Diddy and how that enraged him that she showed up with a Tupac t-shirt. And they're also saying that the Al B. Sure thing, like that he got hospitalized and an attempt was made on his life as well because of the tweets that he made about her death not being natural. And it's this post of him like intubated 
he took this and posted it on his Instagram. And he says, I don't know where to start or if you're truly writing to hear from me yet. You've witnessed only a small portion of my journey. My faith has been shaken but never shook and my humble spirit of discernment has taught me the definition of what sacrifice in silence truly means. Just know that we forgive you but we'll never forget. No, no, no. We forgive you but never to forget including all who assisted along the way before coma and after coma. And so people are like, oh my God, did something happen to him because of that? So then also recently there was a screenshot of uh, a removal request on Kim Porter's Wikipedia. The screenshot is dated um, November 28th. You no longer see this now, but at this time, apparently, uh, there was a thing that said, an editor has nominated this article for deletion. You're welcome to participate in the deletion discussion to which will decide whether or not to retain it. Feel free to improve the article, but do not remove this notice before the discussion is closed. For any information, see the guide to deletion. People are wondering if the things on her Wikipedia page that suggest that maybe her death was not natural and a homicide and controversy and things like that, if it was Diddy or someone affiliated with him who put in that request. I don't know. You decide. Okay, so remember how I told you about Jaguar Wright? She talks a lot about what happened to Kim Porter. She's the one who says that there was a coroner who got fired who ruled it as a homicide and said that she was poisoned and that there are certain poisons that mimic pneumonia symptoms and that she was writing a tell-all book and that Diddy was behind it to stop this book from coming out, that there were two laptops at her home that were stolen, that had copies of the book, that she wasn't where the autopsy said she was found in the bed, she was somewhere else, there was a trail of blood. All this explosive information is coming from her again there's no other source that backs that up other than what she said. Kamora Simmons, who was Kim Porter's very close friend, was one of the first people there when she died, did a whole post about how devastated she was. She posted, after Cassie's lawsuit, a, a cryptic thing on her Instagram where she it said, as you sow, so you shall reap. And people are saying she also thinks something weird happened with Kim Porter's death. Now it's 2019, a year after her death, and Diddy's ex-girlfriend accuses him of being abusive. She says he stomped her, he punched her, he beat her, and it was explosive. And then a year later in 2020 is when Andre Harrell dies. Remember Andre Harrell? He was the founder of Uptown Records, who Diddy interned for. He fired Diddy in 93 saying that he wanted him to get rich. And at the time of his death, he was actually working for a company that Diddy owns called Revolt TV. He was the vice chairman there. It was actually Revolt TV that came out with a statement confirming his death. So it seems like he was on good terms with Diddy, at least professionally. But the rumors with that was that he was also writing a tell-all book and that's why he was killed and blah, blah, blah. And it's not natural causes like the official story is. And this all comes from that same person, Jaguar Wright. She's the one who made the connection of all these people from Uptown dying because of an alleged tell-all books that they were going to come out with. So I don't know, you do with that what you will, but that's what people are saying. And now we get to September 30th. 2023, which was when Keefe D was arrested. Remember, Keefe D is the guy who claims that Diddy put out a hit on Tupac. It's interesting because less than two months after Keefe D was arrested for Tupac's murder is when Cassie came out with her lawsuit. She talks about witnessing Diddy's reaction to hearing that Suge Knight was nearby. In her, I'm going to read you a quote from the lawsuit. It says here, for example, on one occasion when Mr. Combs and Ms. Ventura, that's Cassie by the way, were using drugs together in his home, one of his security staff barged in and announced that Suge Knight, a longtime rival of Mr. Combs, was spotted at Mel's Drive-In Diner in Los Angeles. Mr. Combs began to get dressed, retrieved multiple guns from a safe, and ran out of his home where he believed Mr. Knight was dining. Ms. Ventura became terrified and began to cry. People point this part out of the lawsuit by saying, wait a minute, he ran, got guns. The fact that his security immediately barged in 
means that they all knew that when they see Suge Knight, they want to do something to him. Then immediately runs and gets guns and goes there. What is the intent there? They're going to go and try to what? Kill Suge Knight at Mel's Diner in LA in front of everyone? Like, was this some drug-fueled rage? Sounds like it. She also talked about the what's known as the freak-offs, right? This is the most sensational part of the lawsuit that a lot of people talk about, where she alleges that she was essentially sex trafficked because she worked for him, even though she was his girlfriend, he was her boss, and that he would give her gifts and money and things before, during, and after these, quote, freak-offs. And the freak-offs were basically her engaging in sex acts with male prostitutes that Diddy would pleasure himself to and film and record and then use that to blackmail her. And he would constantly ask her for these freak offs all the time. At one point it was like a weekly thing. And even on her birthday, he would interrupt and show up and be like, I want a freak off. And then she'd have to go with him. And then he would give her all these drugs and she would have to do all these things with a prostitute and he would film it. And use that against her. Like if you say anything or do anything, I'm going to leak this footage. So it is insane. There's also this one incident she talks about where he's beating her so bad in this hotel that she actually ends up finding a way to escape from the hotel room. And as she's running down the hall, he throws like a vase at her and it breaks the glass everywhere and she escapes. And that, um, did he ended up paying the hotel $50,000 to purchase video of that, of him in the hallway throwing the thing at her and that they sold it to him for $50,000. And that's the part that I think is insane is just when there are so many people that are complicit and are willing to just turn a blind eye for money, this is how shit like this happens and happens for so long. As of now, he's been sued two more times by women who are using this act that's about to expire that allows you to file uh, lawsuits about uh, sexual assault even though the statute of limitations has expired. And they are alleging that in one instance, uh, a Jane Doe filed a lawsuit saying that in 1991, Diddy R-worded her um, with uh, another person who is a singer-songwriter called Aaron Hall, that they took turns R-wording her and um, that they filmed it and that she found out from someone else that they had seen the tape of that and intimidated her. And as a result of all of this, he stepped down from Revolt TV, I told you, that company that he owns. And we are still waiting on the trial of the guy who's arrested for killing Tupac, Kifi D. It keeps getting postponed. His arraignment was postponed three times twice to get a lawyer. Then he did get a lawyer. He couldn't pay the lawyer. So now they're giving him a public defender, but his family is still trying to get money to give him a lawyer. And so it's delayed. We'll see, but he pled not guilty. So it looks like there might be a trial and that's pretty much where things stand right now. I'm very curious to know what you guys think about all of this. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.